In this important video, we're going to take a look at how situations affect people's behavior and their understanding of events. So this really translates to why do people do what they do and why do they see the things that they see. Why people see things the way they do. I mean, this is a classic picture that really a different perspective can actually mean a different meaning. Okay, the questions we're really gonna look at tonight is how do situations affect meaning? How does this affect behavior and understanding? And how will understanding the forces involved in situations be a potential game changer? So it's really this, this whole sense of how people make meaning of what's going on. And one of the major things that's overlooked is actually the power of the situation and its effect on meaning. So just a few notes. Uh, this is the first draft of this presentation. Obviously with feedback, we will tidy it up and, and get it uh, even richer. Uh, it's recorded, so relax and absorb. You can watch at a later date. And really to acknowledge the complex, difficult nature of conversations and messaging. It is an infinitely difficult sphere. So really just to you know, allow ourselves to learn it at a, at a good pace. So this is a very interesting story. So there's this lady on a train and there's a couple of children and they're acting you know, really noisy, banging into her and she's getting really quite irate. And then she turns around and says to the father, says, excuse me, can you look after your children? And then he replies, yeah, I'm very sorry we've just come for the mother's funeral i don't know what to do and in that one sentence everything about the situation changes the whole context and the meaning of what the children were doing and then the, the the lady within a moment is is really experiencing a different experience and really the what this really signifies is that meaning does not happen in a vacuum so unlike two plus two equals four in sort of mathematics and wherever you go, that really should be the same. When it comes to behavior, information, it's so changed by all the things around it, all the things that we don't really notice. And it's those things that we're gonna take a look at because they're so key to what something means. And this is what's really must have confused so many of us the last two years where something seems to be very clear to us to mean one thing but someone else will interpret it in a completely different way. So one shift in context and the meaning can completely change. So each event or words are surrounded by an array of invisible assumptions that give context and meaning to the thing that we're looking at. So any facts, events are not perceived in absolute terms, as we just said, it's the situation, the con... Sorry, could you all pop yourselves on mute, please? Uh, we're getting some noise through, thank you. So it's the context of mindsets and delivery information plays a crucial role. So a fact that we think, you know, would be just a fact and always be a fact. For Jane on the left, she will have lots and lots of ideas and assumptions underneath that fact that gives that fact a sort of certain meaning. And Joe will have a different set. Everyone has a unique series of assumptions. And it's where those assumptions really differ. And when you look at the uh, within the pandemic, certain assumptions that people might believe, for instance, say asymptomatic is a thing, that would be such an important building block to so many other conclusions that they make. And someone that would believe that's not a thing would have a completely different interpretation of certain facts. So really context is really massively important as we've discussed before. And it's really is this, it's derived from the Latin words of together and to weave. So really it's the fact that you're looking at or the event or the data combined with all your perception around it and all the other things that are going on in the situation and the context. So it's those two, two things combined that give meaning to something. So its effects are really kind of very powerful. So it's the influence that affects our environment, information plays us intellectually, emotionally, and even physically. So this is a very classic uh, demonstration that these two orange dots are the same size, but because of the surrounding information, they look different. So the surrounding information distorts our perception of the point of focus. In this instance, the orange dot. So the context shapes the information. 
So where a piece of information appears, how we access it, really gives it credibility or, or dismisses credibility. And obviously that's happened a lot over the last two years. So it shapes our minds and our interpretation. Okay. So in situations, as we've mentioned before, effectively what happens is that we stand on a soapbox. The soapbox represents the reservoir of all of our knowledge, our memories, our experiences. And what it does is that we then project out, including our belief systems, we project that out into the conversation. So each person's got a unique view. So whatever's in the soapbox is really the key thing. What are the assumptions, the unconscious knowledge? And this is where we've reached a point in history that the behavioral sciences and so much of the media is now able to sort of talk directly to someone's unconscious mind, which is the soapbox. So then people are taking some very strange assumptions. I mean, this has always happened through history, but it's the media which communicates with the unconscious mind has really reached an advanced stage. So what you have is that generally people are looking at the conversation and the words. And in fact, that is the least important of the three things. And that what's more important is the people's mindsets are having the conversation. And then if we continue to zoom out, then we'll see that it's actually the situation that's even more important than that. And we're going to have a look at a few examples of this. So really, when I talk to people about a conversation, everything we say can affect the conversation on one of these three levels. So we could say a fact, and that would be just the sort of the data element, or we could say something that would affect each other's mental states. So if you said something that made the other person very angry, then the conversation is going to shut down. By the same token, if they say something that affects our mental state, that same thing will happen. But we can also affect the context. So if we think about one of the main things within the context, that if Joe says he's pro-science and he calls us you know, a conspiracy theorist and anti-science, until we change the context of that situation, he's going to dismiss everything we say. So that's one thing that we do show. It's relatively straightforward to do when you've done it a few times. So what we're saying is that the situation itself is massively powerful. And it, we have a tendency as a human just to focus on the, you know, the content of the conversation because it's easiest. But actually within a situation, the context is the most important thing. Then it's our mindsets and our moods and the types of mindsets that we're in. And then the conversation and the way we share information is the last of those three things. So now let's have a look at the situational effect on behavior. And really we could have selected any one of a few hundred very important studies, but this one is a real classic study and it's the Milgram experiments. And it's really showing, you know, just how the power of a situation can affect people. So within the Milgram experiment, what you had, you had a subject here, uh, this person at the bottom, who was told that this person was the study participant. It was actually, in fact, him. And he was to administer electric shocks when this person got a question wrong um, in order to determine whether the electric shock would help the person learn quicker. Now, in fact, what was going on, the experimenter was just seeing how compliant the subject would be to administer pain to a third person. But this third person is just an actor and the subject doesn't have any sort of particular opinion about the actor. And that's kind of important because what Milgram was able to find is that 65% of people would willingly, you know, press, well, not willingly, but would actually press the button to administer pain to another person. And what would happen was, is that they would experience quite severe cognitive dissonance in that they knew you know, they felt that it was quite immoral to press this button. But when the experimenter told them that he would take responsibility, that allowed them to sort of resolve the dissonance and they would continue to press the button. So if you can create a situation like this and make up to two thirds of people literally comply and they weren't getting anything for it and the conditions were really kind of you know, not in sort of life or death situations. So if you can get somewhat two thirds of the population to do that, it really shows that 
compliance is really a problematic thing when people listen to authority. But what was really startling about this study was that when Milgram surveyed experts prior to the study, he asked them how many people would push that button. They estimated less than 1%. Now that's startling because what it shows us that historically, experts have been terrible at really predicting behavior. And I think what's happened the last few decades is that they realized this and they started to create sort of different sets of studies to understand why people did what they did. And what they really found is that a lot of people won't do what they say they would do. For instance, there was another, another study that, sh that was demonstrating where they asked a series of nurses, would you give this cocktail of drugs to a patient? I think it was like 90% plus said no, because it's quite dangerous. But then when they were put in a situation like a different set of nurses and they had an actor phone them up pretending to be a doctor and ask them to prescribe those drugs, over 90% went to do so. So you've got this massive sort of gap between people, what people expect that they would do and actually what they would do. So I'm pretty sure if you surveyed the, the population and asked them if they would press that button, I think most of them would say no. But then when you get a lot of people in that situation, it wouldn't actually be that case. So this is the real gap that we really have to understand. And this really is known, it's quite a popular thing in psychology, and it's really known as the person versus the situation. And we have a tendency, particularly uh, people that are not familiar with this, you know, this conundrum, is that we have a tendency to think it's the person in all instances that we attribute it to their personality when in fact so much of people's behavior is dictated by the situation but because it's so out of our awareness in most instances we don't account for it so understanding these two concepts and how they interact will provide many answers to the last two years and humanity's struggles in general so when you really get a deep understanding of this things begin to make sense that for instance, the Darby and Batson study where they had uh, theology students, they had them in, put into three groups. One group was told that they were late and they had to rush. The second group were told they were on time and the third group were told they had plenty of time. Then they went to an adjacent building to give a sermon. As it turned out, they had placed an actor on the journey who feigned in need of attention. The group that were early and had time to spare, 63% of those stopped, but the group that were rushed, only 10% of those stopped, which hadn't, and it really, they, they'd done sort of personality measurements on them. So there was not a true, uh, you know, anything about their personality, it was the situation that they were placed in. So as humans, if we're stressed out, we have, you know, we're rushed, you know, people scare the hell out of us by the media, then you're gonna see people not acting in their true nature. They're gonna be acting from a very stressed state. It will also reveal many governing forces driving much of behavior. So I'm just following the rules is a classic one. So what we have is we have really these hardwired things that we respond to. And then we have these sort of software, which really is our culture. And you'll see that different cultures will respond to different stimulus. So if we look at Milgram's sort of studies in general, then this comply or not comply, what we can then see is very via a very simplistic model is that Joe in this instance, you know, via various forces, whatever they may be, whether it's scared of a virus or government overreach, whatever, he will then be placed into a situation where he will have that, you know, that question to comply or not comply. And really the question is, what are the forces pushing us down either of these routes? So obviously in the Milgram study, all the forces pushing in to comply was the authority, you know, this, this inbuilt need in humans to comply and do as they're told, which really comes from a lot of the evolutionary, you know, being in herds and packs. But what you find is the behavioral science guys, they really understand this at much a detailed level now that you can create a situation which propels many forces to push here. So all of the media, the, the shaming, the, the guilt trips, all these things are really nudging. You know, that's why it's called a nudge. So it's to create a force to push people down here. So it's really when we stand back and look at what these forces are, then we can start to counteract them. So really a very important point to summarize on this part of the presentation is really good person, bad day. So 
the fundamental error that we make as humans, and it's really known as the fundamental attribution error, is that the tendency for people to overemphasize dispositional or personality-based explanations for behaviors while underemphasizing situational explanations. So this really means that we, if someone does something, we automatically assume it's their personality. But in fact, so much often it's the situation. So most of the people in the, uh, the study with Milgram and the ASH experiments, all the other studies, I think you'll find that they would have been generally probably pretty good human beings put into situations where because of the vulnerabilities of their mindsets allowed them to be in a position where they did some pretty horrible things. And I think when you look at wars and, and many things like that, this is what happens. So in other words, people have a cognitive bias to assume that a person's actions depend on what kind of person that person is, rather than the social environment or forces that influence the person. So when we start to understand these social and environmental forces, that's when everything starts to make sense about what's happened the last few years and how we really need to start to <clears throat> create the situations where people are not under those forces. And then you'll start to see people act in a, in a much different way. I mean, the classic example of this as well, the way our brains work is that when somebody else does something, it's their personality. But when we do something, it's the situation. <laughs> so, you know, if someone doesn't ring us, we will say, oh, you know, lack of respect. But if we don't ring them, it was just a busy day. Uh, particularly, uh, you may see an academic, a maths professor, his students may get straight A's. He will then say, right, I'm a great professor. But if they fail, oh, they didn't do the homework. So you'll see this real bias um, that plays itself out constantly. And of course, if you get you know, egotistical people in positions of power, that's going to be amplified. So then let's have a, another look at really the next level down, which is the mindset. So really a person's interpretation of events. And this obviously happens within a situation. So previously on the slide with Joe, we saw the tannoy, which really signaled Joe projecting out into the world his perceptions which are in his soapbox, but this one, this is a magnifying glass. So what we're gonna see in these ones is how Joe interprets the world. So here's a classic example. And I think we'll be seeing this a lot, um, certainly within the, what we would you know, deem the truth movements is this, this hypervigilance. So there was a, a neuroscientist professor where I did one of his courses and he, he was telling a story where he was walking through a, a park in Taiwan and he saw this sign and it was and it wasn't in English but he saw the snake so he thought okay I've got to be careful of snakes and then what happened was on the journey he said he saw 20 snakes what he actually saw was two snakes and 18 sticks but because the mind was in a hypervigilant state what he saw was amounted to you know 20 snakes so when we get into a mental state where something is obviously you know part of our safety then we will start to see things not completely as they are so over the last two years because everyone you know there's been this real fear porn by the media and and the sage notes really showed that fear was a tactic people are going to start seeing things in a very hyper vigilant way so if you sneeze or cough around someone you're going to see them act very differently to how they did a couple of years ago um, and actually, one other point to make on this is that, you know, this not to trigger the gorilla. So when we're in a conversation, if the other person triggers into a very emotional state, then you're going to see a very irrational person. Likewise, if we do so. Uh, come on, that's my dog drinking, by the way. Okay. So then we have this other very interesting phenomenon, which is around media and context. So if Joe is used to the mainstream media, what's gonna happen is that where a headline appears is gonna have a completely different meaning. So they did this study, I think it was in Munster, uh, and I've just put a few comedy uh, newspapers up there. But what they showed was that they had 15 different headlines and they rotated them through four magazines. And then they had people assess the credibility and the accuracy of the headline. And depending on where it appeared, it had a completely different credibility. 
So this is one of the reasons why you've got this, you know, trusted news initiative and, and, you know, all the media controlled by a certain amount of people, because they know that where a piece of information appears has a huge effect on the meaning to most people. So this really is very important thing to overcome because people literally will say, oh, where did you see that? And then obviously, additionally, you've got the fact checkers. So what you've got is that people's in interpretation of data is so different and of course if people have been conditioned so long to only trust certain sources if those sources are not being unbiased and not presenting both sides of the story then the person is going to have a very warped view of reality and this is why we start to see these crazy things like people saying you know there's a consensus of all the scientists etc the reality couldn't be further from the truth but to that person that's what feels real so we have this other effect that's going on that's very fascinating which is around identity and meaning um, and <clears throat> this is so prevalent that they did a study by the 2015 general election where they proposed and this was just a study it wasn't actually going to happen they said they wanted to add a penny to VAT and they said the reason was to have 10,000 extra nurses and what they told half of the participants in the study was that it was a conservative initiative. And they told the other half that it was a labor policy. Of conservatives that were told it was conservative policy, four times as many people supported it as to when they thought it was labor. And in fact, it was almost the same numbers in reverse. So it was actually who proposed the policy was much more important than from where the policy came from. So how does this affect, uh, you know, within the pandemic? So if people, if a, a scientist has been labeled as being crazy or conspiracy theorists or blacklisted, then that really affects the way that people will listen. So this identity of, you know, I'm following the science is such a powerful thing that once someone is identified with a concept, so once someone says I'm pro-science and you're an anti-vaxxer, until we reverse those identities, we're not going to see much of a conversation go on. So this the situation identity. So had Joe's watching things, he's unaware that who is saying things is having a massive effect on his, his assumptions on whether it's true or not. And then this one is, is just a really a taste of one of the, the sort of nudges and the, the cognitive biases that our brain does, and it's called the primacy effect. Now <clears throat> The first piece of information that we're exposed to is how we form the foundation of the knowledge on that subject. And the easiest way I can explain this is it's a bit like, imagine driving to a campsite and the campsite represents our mind. And within the campsite, we've got one area of the campsite, which is very mild diseases. And we've got one over the left, which is very serious diseases. Now, when I'm exposed to a piece of information on a disease, where do I pitch my tent? is called into the first piece of information. So what was the first piece of information that most people saw? People dropping dead in the street. So rather than sort of pitching the foundation over at the place which is mild illness, the foundation is then pitched over in the serious disease thing and all subsequent information is filtered through that lens. That's why first impressions are so very important and that's why the primacy effect is so key. So a lot of the media will be very intentional about the first uh, exposure on a subject. And uh, I need to check this, but I was advised as well that Tedros came out and before he spoke about COVID, he spoke about Ebola to sort of create that, as that association. So really, hopefully now we can start to see that every person is going to have a unique perspective and that perspective is going to be really what they're exposed to. So I think most of us that are challenged in the narrative really don't watch the mainstream news. So we wouldn't have had lots of these assumptions sort of pumped into our mind. Um, so there's this other thing that's really, really key, which really is, is really controlling what people see in a situation. And someone really re recently sent me this that really shocked me. I was really couldn't believe it to be true. So I sort of you did it myself and it's strictly true that in Google, if you type the universe, what it does, it comes up and it tells you there's 4 billion results. OK, 
Okay, so you assume that Google's given you the access to these 4 billion. What actually happens is that when you scroll through, it actually only shows you 166 of those 4 billion. So effectively, what Google's saying is there's this massive universe out there of 4 billion sites or results that I can show you, but these are the 166 that I'm going to allow you to see. And even if you sort of this bit where it says, oh, we've hidden a few search, uh, searches, but you take that off, you then only get 431. Now, it's quite hard to comprehend how, you know, the person showing you the news is really showing you what they're going to let you look at. So anything that, so when you think about the average person, unless they intentionally go out their way to notice or ask these questions, there is a distinct possibility that they don't know that any of this exists, any of the things that people are speaking up, because they've been, they've been given a good, and hopefully by now people have got lots of questions, but it really is feasible. There are people, particularly those that are, you know, in a certain lifestyle may not have seen anything. So what you have is that Joe watching the TV is really going to be in a position that he's not going to be aware that he's going to be absorbing so much information unconsciously. So if we think about the situation, it's really each situation could be a scene in a movie. And it really is a great exercise to check the assumptions on either a sentence or a scene. For instance, there was a question on the BBC that said, when will you get your XXX referring to the new medical procedure? Now that assumes that the person's going to get it. It doesn't ask the why or the how, it just makes these assumptions. So the things that are really pumped into our minds unconsciously are so key. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So in the, um, I do some study and watching some TV to watch how they're really trying to decide people to think certain things. So in, in the Jack Reacher, um, there's the, the initial scene where Jack walks into a town and he's walking outside of a store and then an angry bloke comes out and the angry bloke is being very abusive to his girlfriend. And then sort of Jack walks over there and sort of, you know, just stands there and stares the guy out. And then the guy apologizes, etc. So the assumption from that scene is that you then start to build a rapport with the character. You start to like the character because of his moral status. So then there's another scene not so long later where Jack then looks after a dog and helps him, you know, because the owner's not looking after him. So all the time, this unconscious thing is building your association. And this really is what PR is so much about. So when you look at a, a few of the billionaires, when they have such great, you know, uh, reputations about being, you know, very kind to the world, even though you know, a lot of it could be just said as investments, it's because people haven't really asked the question what they've been told. They've just been, you know, taken out of face value. So really the media has such a massive power via situations and scenes to really dictate how a person views the world. And that's why we've really got to ask these deeper questions. So really it's about creating the conditions. So you may have seen that the very limited debate that does occur the situation is really usually created where you may have three or four pro-narrative people and then they'd have a couple of people, you know, just from the members of the public. So you really, from people directing the situations, they know how to create a situation to really get the outcome that they want. And you can, there's loads of formulas. There's a formula obviously for divide and conquer. They know how to create the situation to create that. But there's even a formula to to actually corrupt people's moral compass. And it works for about 65% of, of the population. So really, when we look at manufacturing conclusions, which is really what it's about a lot of the time, Plato said, those who tell the stories rule society. And really up until 1968, there was actually a UK statutory theater censorship. <laughs> so for a couple of hundred years, the theaters were not allowed to have certain sort of uh, messages in them if it questioned the government or the monarchy in any way and i think it's been known for a long long while uh, by certain establishments that you know the people that tell the stories are really the key and and i 
did read somewhere that in a lot of places it was compulsory to go to the theater so you got your your sort of stories and and joseph campbell's work on uh the hero of a thousand faces really shows that every culture really passed on knowledge via stories so really it's how we tell the stories in the situations that's very very key so this does bring us to and really tonight I think there's going to be a few uncomfortable conclusions, but once we get over these, certainly once I've realized these in my own self, it really does allow for a lot of skill in understanding people's knowledge and then how to engage. There's this thing known as the objectivity illusion. And really the first part of it is that we're, there's a conviction that our own perceptions, preferences, tastes, priorities are objective and others should share them. So whenever you meet someone pro-narrative, they're going to be, completely of this view and a lot of us will also be of this view um, and that's just human nature that's just the way the brain works and obviously the more wise we get the more we start to look at our own soapbox the more we realize that it's it's all about a different perspective and one of the examples i gave at the weekend was if you have two umpires and one of them says he calls it as it is he's under the illusion that he can be completely objective whereas the other one will say i call it as i see it he's aware that all of us have a unique perspective. The second part of this, which I'm sure we all uh, will share over the last couple of years is undue optimism about our ability to persuade others who disagree with us. That is just one aspect of this um, objectivity illusion. And there's a very good TED talk by Lee, uh, it's Lee Ross on this one. And the third thing is negative attributions about those who disagree with us. They're unreasonable, irrational, and have succumbed to various biases. We may even go as far to say they're stupid. Um, and it's really, there is a very important part around critical thinking and the ability to question things, but it's generally not about intelligence. In fact, a lot of us will find that the more intelligent or the more qualifications someone has, a lot of the time, the more they may believe something. So yeah, it gets quite complex, but... These three things, really, when we make ourselves aware of these, then we can really realize that what we think is going to happen and what actually happened might be different. And when we understand why, then we can get a lot more accuracy under understanding predicting behavior. So in summary, um, the situation and its components are important to understand in order to manage an effect. So really to unrig this game, as I say it. So a lot of the time you'll be in a conversation Someone will call you an anti-vax or a conspiracy theorist. At that point, the game's rigged. They have already been persuaded to assume certain things. And it's at that point that we have to unrig the game. Until we unrig that game, um, it really won't be much progress. And, you know, we've had a lot of success in doing this. Um, we have biases that are being manipulated. And having good knowledge of these allows better accuracy. So the human brain has weaknesses and vulnerabilities. It's a bit like a computer without a virus software. But the thing is, once you spot these, then you generally can't unspot them. So once you know that a certain, say, a, a media company is lying to you, that's it, really. The game's up. They're, they're not going to be able to convince you of many things. But that's a key step. And really this third thing that those that tell the stories or direct the situations govern most people's behavior and understanding. That's what's really key for us to understand that it's the situation is more important than the person. And therefore we start designing situations that become much more successful. I mean, as, a, as an example, if people have been very conditioned to ignore marches and told they're just crazy people, then maybe we need to adjust the situation of a march so it doesn't fall into that category anymore. Um, so it's really this understanding the interpretation that people who believe the narrative will have and then finding ways around that. So uh, in uh, coming to a close, presentations in the course are free. If you have benefited and would like to support, you can please uh, do so here. And uh, I'm going to open up for questions.